And if you're not familiar with this story, uh, this is when Jesus is with his disciples and he's walking off to go pray before, he's be, um, before they come to take him away to be crucified, to be judged. So in Matthew 26, 36, <clears throat> then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane and he said, and this is in red, so this is important. This is Jesus talking. Sit here and wait while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, John and James. And he became uh, anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed to the grief, to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little further and bowed with his face down to the ground praying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned to his disciples and found them asleep. He said to Peter, Couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch, pray, so that you will not be given into temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, My Father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. So he went to pray a third time, saying the same things again. Then he, uh, then he came to the disciples and said, Go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But look, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is at hand. So today I want to jump into our message. Um, it's going to be kind of an uncomfortable topic. It's going to be something that we don't really like to talk about, especially in America. You see, in America, we, we greatly value our freedom. We greatly value our independence. Then we just have a holiday celebrating our independence, right, just a couple days ago. And we value that. And they, those are, these are good things. These are awesome things. But today, I want to talk about what I have dubbed the S word. All right. Now, it's not the S word most of you are thinking. All right. Get your minds out of the gutter. All right. The S word I'm referring to is submission. Submission. You see, when most people hear the word submission, they think of scriptures like Romans 13, 1, where the Bible commands us to obey the ruling authorities in our government, right? Or maybe you think of verses like Hebrews 13, 17, where the Bible commands us to obey and submit to our church authorities, right? Or maybe you're super spiritual and you read your Bible and you think of uh, chapters like Ephesians 5 and 6, where the Bible commands wives to submit to their husband, children to obey their parents, and slaves to listen to their masters. And you see, all of this is true. All of this it is a part of the Bible. It is a part of the Bible's definition of submission because what the Bible teaches us is that submission is a normal part of the Christian life. Submission is a normal part of the Christian life. It's why, guys, our elections matter, right? It's why it matters who we put in office because as Christians, we are told to submit to them, to obey them, to listen to them. This is why the church you go to matters, right? Because if you're a Bible-believing Christian and you have a spiritual authority in your life, you are told to listen to them. You were told to submit. Guys, this is why marriage matters. Listen to me, ladies. This is why the man you choose to be your husband matters. Okay, because if you are a Bible-believing Christian, if you are a woman of God, you know that his word tells you to submit. All right? And that his word also teaches that your children are to obey you and your husband. This is why, guys, it matters the job you take. Because if you're to be a biblical employee, you are to listen to your boss, whether they're a good boss, a bad boss, or an awful boss. All right? That is what the Word of God teaches. But we must never forget that while all of this is a part of submission, while listening to our government, obeying our church authorities, and, and honoring God's prescription for the family life is a part of submission, our submission is first and, foremost, first and foremost to God himself. Submission is first and foremost towards God. You see, the definition of submission 
is this. It is the action of yielding to a superior force or to the will and authority of another person. That sounds real fancy. I got that off the internet. All right, you cannot quote me for that. Google gave me that one. But whenever I heard that definition, my immediate thought was a yield sign, right? You guys who have your driver's license, you know what a yield sign is, right? I hope you do. Okay, it's the, it's the triangle, right? It says yield on it. And what it means is that whenever you approach one of those, you don't have to stop. You should stop, but you don't have to. All right, most of you guys just blow right through them. What you're supposed to do is whenever you approach a yield sign, you're supposed to look both ways and make sure there's no oncoming traffic. What that does is that allows you to see Willie's tractor trailer coming that uh, coming towards you at 55 miles an hour and gives you the chance to say, okay, let me wait. Let me let him go first. See, that's what submission is. Submission is me saying, I want to do this, right? I want to do this thing. Well, they want to do that over there. Okay, well, submission says, I'm going to go do what they want instead of what I want, right? We don't see that too often, guys. We don't see that modeled for us too often in this life. We don't see that modeled too often for us in this world. We definitely don't see that modeled towards God, our Father. Well, thankfully, he gave us a perfect example. Thankfully, God sent his son to be the perfect model. Todd read it earlier. I want to read it to you in a, from a different version of the story in Luke chapter 22, verse 42. Jesus shows us what true submission is. He says, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. That right there is true submission, modeled for us by Jesus Christ himself. You see, if you're like me, you read that and you can think, how can Jesus say that? Right? He knows what's coming. He knows the pain he's about to endure. He knows he's about to be separated from his father. Well, he can say that because he knows something we don't know. You see, Jesus knew that there is incredible freedom through submission. Romans chapter 6 paints a beautiful picture and gives us amazing imagery of the freedom we have after submitting to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In verses 6 through 7, it says, We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Verse 14 continues on. It says, Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law, Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Verse 18 continues. It says, now you are free from your slavery to sin and you have become slaves to righteous living. And verse 22 finishes it up beautifully. It says, but now you are free from the power of sin and become slaves of God. You see, the Bible teaches, and Jesus knew, that there is incredible freedom that comes from submitting to our Heavenly Father. That is why in John 8, 36, he tells us, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Free indeed, guys. See, that's how Jesus can say, Father, your will be done, not mine. But see, he didn't just know about the freedom that comes with submission. He also knew that there is incredible power through submission. There is incredible power through submitting to God our Father. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So many of us guys spend our whole lives running from Satan and his forces, fleeing like like scared children, okay? But the Bible teaches that we have all the power we need to defeat him and cause him to run away from us. And that power comes through submission to God our Father. James 4.10 continues, it says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. Lift you up in honor, guys. That, that word is also translated into the phrase exalt you, all right? Exalted means you are placed in a position of authority, Okay, there is authority that comes only through submitting to God. And Jesus knew that. And he wanted us to know that. The third thing, though, that comes through submission to, to God our Father is that there is incredible blessing through submission. There are blessings that only come through submission to God our Father. We've all heard, or at least most of us, I believe, have heard Psalm 23. It's read at a lot of funerals. We've even used a few messages around here. But Psalm chapter 23, verses 1 through 3, says, The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows, and he leads me beside peaceful streams. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Beautiful passage, right? Incredible imagery. Powerful, powerful scripture. But don't miss the key. That only applies to his sheep. That only applies to the people who have accepted the authority of God as their shepherd. You're not submitting to God. You don't get the blessings of being his sheep. James 4, 6 quotes Proverbs 3, 34 when it says this. It says, the Lord opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to those who submit to him. And what is grace but God's goodness in our life? 
What is grace but God's favor poured out on us in abundance? Those are the blessings that await everyone who submits to God our Father. So you may be wondering, as I did, if all of this is available, how do we get it? Is it, is it really that simple? Is it really as simple as submission? And the answer is yes, it truly is. But like so many things in the Bible, just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy. Hear me, guys. Just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy. We've missed something, all right? The Bible promises us freedom, yet I see so many of my brothers and sisters still in bondage, still chained to their old way of thinking, still chained to their old way of living. See, the Bible promises us power, and yet I see so many Christians walking around defeated with their head between their legs. The Bible promises us blessings, and yet how many of us are struggling just to get by? How many of us are struggling just to make it? We've missed something, guys. What is it? Well, I think if we dive deeply into this passage that that Todd was kind enough to read for us earlier, we will see the things we have to submit to in order to receive God's freedom, God's power, and God's blessings in our life. And there are three things I want us to look at today, three things I want us to focus on that if we submit to these three things, we will experience God's freedom, we will experience his power, and we will experience his blessings. The first of which is this. In order to receive all the gifts that God wants to give to us, we have got to submit to his will. We've got to submit to his will. If you go back and listen to our sermon from last week, we learned that God's will is his desire or preference for us. It is the what he wants for our lives, all right? God's will is his desire and preference for us. Matthew 26, 39, Todd read it earlier. It says, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. How many of us can say that, right? Not me, not most days. But see, Jesus had this mindset from day one. He had been telling his disciples this for months and months. In John 6, 38, it says, For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my will, not to do mine. Once again, though, guys, how can he say that? It's, it's easy to say, but he meant it, right? If he didn't mean it, he wouldn't have ended up on the cross. He meant it. See, Jesus can say that. Jesus can mean that because he knew this truth. He knew this truth that I think God wants all of us to learn today. He knew the truth that what God wants for us is better than what we want for ourselves. What God wants for us is better than what we want for ourselves. Romans 12, 2 says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And pay attention here. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing, and perfect. Hear that? Good, and pleasing, and perfect is God's will. It is so much better for you than that which you want for yourself. Think about it like this. Many of you know I I have a a, a a one-and-a-half-year-old daughter. We have another baby on the way. I also have a um, a three-year-old goddaughter, and we've got a bunch of nieces and nephews and other random kids that end up at our house somehow. (laughs) And one thing I've noticed uh, in being blessed to be surrounded by all of these children is that left to their own volition, children will consume nothing but sugar, okay? Children will eat nothing but candy and drink nothing but juice, all right? They'll use green beans to throw at each other in a game, but they won't eat them, all right? And we're the same way, right? We want all these things that are all around us that we think will make us happy. We think will bring us joy. We think that they're, they're what the, that life is all about. But what God's saying in his word, that what he wants for us is so much better. Right? As parents, we want our children to grow up healthy. We want our children to grow up strong. We want our children to grow up with a strong immune system. So we have them eat vegetables, right? kicking and screaming sometimes. We have them take naps so that they're rested and, and restored. We have them do things they don't want to do because we know that what we want for them is better than what they want for themselves. Now, that should raise a, a question in all of us, though, and it's a question I think we're all going to face at some time, at some point or another in life. If God's will is good and pleasing and perfect, then what about the bad stuff in life? What about the painful stuff in life? What about the things that we don't like thinking about that we would purge from our memory if we could? Well, see, the Bible, thankfully, does not shy away from that. In 1 Peter 3.17, the Bible says, For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. You see, it is commonly taught throughout Scripture, throughout the Old Testament and the New, 
that suffering can and will be a part of God's will for your life. Suffering can and will be a part of God's will for your life. If this is the first time you're hearing it, I'm sorry, but it's true. John 16, Jesus Christ himself tells us, you will have suffering in this world. Go back to 1 Peter. You know the guy who wrote that, Peter, the apostle? Man knew about suffering, all right? He was beaten, he was arrested, he was in prison. He was eventually crucified for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, for sharing the good news of salvation. And that was a part of God's will. It wouldn't have happened otherwise. You see, many of you know my father last year was, was called to, to move to Florida to, to start a, a campus down there. And this was a part of God's will. This was something God had spoken to him clearly, right? There was no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And while I love to give him a hard time about moving to the Sunshine State to avoid the, the winters here, let's never forget, guys, there has been tremendous suffering that has come as a result of him following God's will for his life. There has been suffering in separation from relationships and distance from people he cares about. There has been suffering in so many ways, and it has all been a part of God's will. Just this week, I had somebody very near and dear to my heart go through something extremely painful. I honestly can't imagine the pain they've gone through. I can't imagine the, the suffering they're experiencing. And that's part of God's will? Is it? The Bible says it is. So how can that be good? How can these things that cause us pain be good? How can the suffering we all endure in this life be good? Well, I'll tell you how. Romans eight twenty eight. One of my all-time favorite Bible verses says, and we know that God causes everything, everything, your worst day, your darkest night, your most guilt-ridden moment, everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are calling, called according to his purpose for them. Remember, his purpose for you is his will for your life. God is saying that all things, everything, will work together for the good of those who love him and are living their life according to his will. And so that's a crazy promise that he's given us. And the crazy promise is this, if it's not good, it's not over. Hear me, if it's not good, it's not over. If it's not good, he's not done. If it's not good, God is not finished. Think about this. Think about Good Friday, right? Was it good for Jesus Christ to be whipped for my sins? Was it good for Jesus Christ to be beaten for your transgressions? Was it good for Jesus Christ to die an agonizing death on the cross over a span of hours for your sake and for mine? No. The only reason Good Friday was good is because Easter completed the work. All right, is because he rose again on that third day and he accomplished what he came to earth to do. And in the same way, God wants to work all the pain, all the suffering, all the heartache in your life out for good and for the good of everybody in your life that are called according to his purposes and living according to his will. So that's some pretty dang good news, isn't it? Well, I've got some more for you. Not only does God call us to submit to his will, but the good news is that God wants to tell us his will. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. Ephesians 5.17 commands us. And remember, God doesn't give us commands that we can't accomplish, all right? Ephesians 5.17 says, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, remember, if you don't know this, God's will for everybody in creation is to love him and love others, right? These are the greatest commands. We are all called, we are all created to love God and love one another. But God also has a will for you specifically. He has a will for your life that is designed with you in mind. And I've got, I've got something that I want you guys to hear. And I want you to pay attention. So look up from your notes just for a second and listen. All right. God's specific will for your life, it's not a secret, but it is private. Okay. God's will for your life is not a secret, but it is private. Now, what do I mean by that? It's not secret in that it is not something that he is hiding from you, that he is keeping from you, that he is holding back but it is private because he wants to share it with you in the context of a close and intimate relationship. And you're not going to get it otherwise. You're not going to get to know God's will for your life without that personal connection, without walking with him side by side. 
You're not going to get to know God's will for your life if you have the kind of relationship where you text him once a week just to tell him how your day's been. No, you're only going to get to know God's will for your life if you're in constant, daily, intimate communication with him. Because that's what he wants, right? God wants to be close to you. That's why he whispers to us in the storm. He doesn't whisper so that it's hard to hear. No, he whispers to draw us close, right? He whispers to draw us closer to his presence so that we can hear him clearly. Now, that's free. I won't charge you guys for that. But this overall idea, the fact that God's will is better than ours, the fact that what he wants for us is better than what we want for ourselves, is why we can pray as Jesus commanded us in Matthew 6, verse 10, when he said, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, we can only pray that. We can only pray thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven because we know and we believe that his will is better. Now, before we move on to the, the next point, before we move on to the next uh, thing that we have to submit to, I want to give you guys something to, to try and incorporate in your life over the next week, over the next month, over the next decade of your life. The next time you are frustrated because God doesn't give you something that you want, the next time you're, you're upset because things didn't go the way you wanted them to, I want you to thank God. I want you to thank God for all the times in your life that he didn't give you what you wanted because what he wanted for you was better. Think back, all right, I'm telling you guys, if you were honest with yourself and you look back over your life, you will see time and time again that he didn't give you what you wanted because he had something better in store for you. And so if you practice and incorporate that attitude of gratitude, that, that gratefulness becomes a part of your daily, daily living, your life can't be the same. Your life won't be the same. But not only do we have to submit to God's will, not only do we have to submit to his desire for our lives because they are better than what we want for ourselves, but number two, we have got to submit to his way. We have got to submit to God's way, the how he accomplishes his will. Matthew 26, 42, another translation from the, different from the one read earlier, but it says, my father, if there is no other way than this, drinking this cup to the dregs, I'm ready. Do it your way. You see, Jesus was reminding us in that vulnerable prayer, what we learn in Isaiah 55, 8 where the Lord teaches us that my thoughts are not like your thoughts and your ways are not like my ways. You see, the Bible again and again and again makes that point. The same point told to us in Proverbs 14, 12, where it says there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. Proverbs 12, 15 says it like this. It says, fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. You see, what the Bible is teaching us, what, what God's word is trying to tell you today is that our way ends in death. That our way is nothing but foolishness. That our way will lead to our destruction and the destruction of everybody we care about. But God's way, the truth is that God's methods of accomplishing his will are better than ours. Hear me, God's methods of accomplishing his will are so much better than ours. His way is greater than our way. Isaiah 55, 9 says, For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Think about it for a second, guys. It is a common theme throughout Scripture, but you've also seen it in your life. We've also already talked about it here at this church. John 3, 16. Right? Anybody ever heard John 3, 16 before? Right? If you've been in a church for more than five seconds, somebody's probably quoted it at you, but if not, let me be the first to do so. Right? For God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, I know that was a, a bit of a weird combination of NLT, KJV, and something else, but that, that concept is weird, if you ever think about it, right? God's way of saving the earth, God's way of saving you and me, is really weird if you think about it. If somebody gave me the task of saving the soul of everyone in this room, let me just go ahead and be honest. My first thought is not going to be to sacrifice Hazel, right? My first thought is not going to be to allow the child that I care about to suffer for your sake, right? But thank goodness, thank the Lord that his way is better than our way. And you want to know why that is? You want to know why God's ways are, are better than ours, why his, his methods are higher than ours? It's because he can see the whole picture, right? God sees the entire picture. I don't know if you guys have ever tried to put a puzzle together, but I, I fancy myself to be quite a, a, a good puzzler, all right? I think I'm pretty good at it. Um, well, then last night, 
we were putting together this floor mat that we got for Hazel, and it came in these little puzzle pieces, all right? And me being the um, stubborn, hard-headed man I am, did not look at the instructions, didn't even look at the box, all right? I just dumped all the pieces out on the ground and then started putting them together, all right? Well, 10 minutes go by, and I get done, and I look up at Brianna, my wife, and I say, we're missing some pieces, because there's this giant hole in the middle of the mat. She's like, those are all the pieces it came with. And then finally, I did what I should have done at the beginning, and I said, well, what's it supposed to look like? All right, see, I've been trying to put all these pieces together, not even knowing what the mat was supposed to look like. All right? And yeah, that's funny. And I laughed at myself. And I looked at Brianna, and I said, this is going to be a sermon illustration. All right? It's funny, but it's the same way we live our lives. All right? We're trying to do our things our way, and we can't see the whole picture. But God can. All right? See, God knows the end of the story. He knew how Easter was going to end. That is why John 3.16 makes sense, all right? Because he exists outside of time and space. He knows the beginning, he knows the end, and he knows everything in between. That is why the Bible can command us in Colossians 3.2, stay focused on what's above, not on earthly things. Stay focused on what's above, not on earthly things. When I read that verse, I think of the story of a, a young hero. He's, he's on an adventure with, with his companions, and they're traveling through a, a dark forest. And in their travels, they become lost, and they wander around the dark forest for hours and hours and hours, trying to find a way out, and they can't. They're stuck. Well, eventually, the young hero looks around and says, wait, I'm surrounded by tall trees. Why don't I climb one of these trees, and maybe I can see a way out? And that's what he does. He climbs a tall tree he can find. He gets to the top. He sees the, the amazing, beautiful view all around them, and he sees the way out. Well, how did he do that? He changed his perspective, all right? And that's what we need as well. We have got to change our perspective. We've got to change our earthly perspective out for a heavenly one, all right? And only God can give us the heavenly perspective we need to do things his way. But I've got good news for you once again. I've got good news for you. See, God doesn't just tell us to submit to his way. God doesn't just command us that his ways are higher than our ways. But God wants to teach us his way. God wants to teach us his way. Go back to Psalm 23, verse 3, where it says, He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. He guides me along. See, the, the, the picture that paints is not of a lecturer, right, sitting in an auditorium of 300 people yelling at them about some, some, some subject. No, what that speaks of is a tutor, right, who walks you through the problems and shows you step by step how to get to the solution right? He guides us. My question, though, for you, and, I, and I, had to, I had to face this myself this morning, actually, is do we actually want that? Do we actually want God's guidance? You see, too often we, and by we, I include myself, we go to God with our plans, and we want him to rubber stamp them. We go to God with, with our ideas, and we want him to approve them. Instead of going to God and saying, hey, God, please show me the way you want me to go, we go to God and say, hey, look, this is a map I drew. This is a plan I came up with. Will you please, please sign off on this? But that's not what the Bible says God wants to do. The Bible says that God wants to guide us along the right paths. That's why Psalms 25, 4 through 5 has to be our prayer. It has to be our prayer. It says, teach me your ways, O Lord. Make them known to me. Teach me to live according to your truth, for you are my God who saves me. I always trust in you. Man, there's a lot. There's a lot in that scripture, right? God's ways, his truth, right, lead to our salvation. But did you see the key there to learning God's ways? Did you happen to notice the, the, the way he says that you're going to become knowledgeable of his way of living? At the very end, it says, I always trust in you. That expression, trust in you, is the same one used to say, I hope in you, right? I wait on you. I lean on you for support. The picture I get in my mind, again, is somebody who's hurt their foot and is desperately dependent on their crutches to make it around, right? Or if you're Tahisha, a hot pink scooter, all right? But you're desperately dependent on God. You're leaning on him. And so the key to learning God's way is dependence, the key to learning God's way is depending on him every single day of your life, saying, God, I can't even walk without holding your hand. God, I can't make it through this day. I can't make it through this hour. I can't make it through this minute without you. Because you see, when you realize that God is all you have, 
you're forced to recognize that he's all you need. And if he's all you need, then why would you ever try to do something your way? Why wouldn't you do everything his way? I hope y'all can grasp that. I hope you receive that. I hope God plants that truth deep within your hearts. But not only must we submit to God's will for our lives, his desires for us, and not only do we have to submit to his way, the, the how he chooses to accomplish it, his methods, which are so much higher than ours. But third thing we have to submit to, and this is the hard one, guys, this is the tough one, is his waiting. We have got to submit to the when he does it. Matthew 26, 45 through 46, the last two verses from our passage today says this, says, but look, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, oh, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. See, Jesus didn't look at God and say, five more minutes, right? Give me five more minutes with my, my friends. Give me five more minutes with my comrades. Give me five more minutes, God. No, he said, time has come. It is here. It's time to get going. You see, he already knew this, by the way. A few days earlier, prior to the Lord's Supper, prior to him washing his disciples' feet, John 13, 1 tells us that Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. See, he, he showed us through his conversation with God and his conversation with his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane that we have got to submit to God's timing. And the truth is that he can only do that. The reason he could do that is because God's timing is better than ours. God's timing is better than ours. His timing is perfect. Ours is incredibly flawed. That's why 1 Peter 5, 6 says this. It says, so humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. I think of Hazel whenever I, I read that scripture. Um, and I know one day she, Hazel's going to get upset with me for using her as a sermon illustration so often, but such is the, the lot whenever you, you grow up in church. But Hazel, my daughter, if any of you know her, a little redheaded girl, all right, loves food, okay? Loves food with a passion, okay? Every time she sees her plate at home, she gets excited, all right? And then she gets even more excited when she sees that there's food on it. And then she gets really angry <laughs> when she doesn't have that food in front of her right away, okay? What she doesn't realize, though, is that, is, is that if she ate that food immediately after her mom put it on the, on the plate, is that it would burn her, is that it would hurt her, is that it would cause her pain. All right. You see, we're just like Hazel, though. All right. We want things when we want them. We want things when we right now. We don't want to wait for anything. We want our blessings in this moment. But Lamentations 23, 26 through 27 says, so it is good to wait quietly for salvation from the Lord, and it is good for people to submit at an early age the yoke of his discipline. So the Bible teaches us that that waiting for God's timing is a good thing. That waiting for God's timing is a blessing. You see, the, the reason that the Bible teaches us that is because God is saving our blessings for the right time, right? He's not holding back, right? He's not withholding from you. No, he's, he's saving them for the right time, right? Psalm thirty-one nineteen says it this way. It says, how great is the goodness you have stored up for those who fear you. You lavish it on those who come to you for protection, blessing them before the watching world. God's storing up blessings for you. He is storing up goodness to, to pour out on you in abundance before everyone around. You see, I don't know if you guys are like me, but I personally hate waiting. <laughs> During our engagement, I tried to talk Brianna, my, my wife, uh, into going to the courthouse, just blowing off the whole dang wedding thing. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to go ahead, be married. All right, I, I could not stand waiting for for the day to come. And you guys might be like me. All right, maybe, maybe you're like me, and you you hate waiting. You especially hate waiting whenever you don't know the actual timetable. All right. Well, I've got good news for you. All right. God wants to bless us in our waiting, not just after it. God wants to bless us in our waiting, not just after it. Isaiah forty thirty one. Another one of my all-time favorites. It says, But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You see, that scripture, which I, I've never looked in that context before, with that, but what that scripture is teaching us is that in our waiting, God promises us strength. In our waiting, he grants us speed, endurance, and stamina. In our waiting, 
not after. See, Lamentations 3.25 continues. It says, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. The author of Lamentations, by the way, Jeremiah the prophet, knew a thing or two about waiting. All right, I've been reading in, in Jeremiah's other book recently in my own time in the scriptures, and Jeremiah had 40 years, four decades of failed ministry. 40 years of prophesying in the Lord's name, speaking his word to a group of people, only to be rejected time and time again. Guys, they continued to reject him even after his prophecies came true. Even as they were living out the things he told them were happening, were going to happen, they still continued to reject the word of the Lord from him. But he said, it is good to wait for him because God was good to him in his waiting. God blessed him in his waiting. And he knew the story of his ancestors. All right? Think about the Israelites and their waiting. All right? The Israelites spent 400 years in Egypt waiting to go to the promised land that had been foretold to their, their ancestors. And in Exodus 1-7, it tells us that during their waiting, it says, they multiplied so greatly that they became extremely powerful and filled the land. All right. After that, it talks about how they became so powerful that they terrorized, they scared their rulers who then enslaved them. Well, what did they do? They multiplied some more. Right? They became more powerful because God blessed them in their waiting. This is why we can pray Psalm 37-7 to be true of our lives, where it says, Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently. That phrase patiently just means don't give up. Don't give up, guys. Do not quit. Do not lose hope. Keep on going. That's why Jesus in Matthew 7, verses 7 through 8, commands us, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Don't give up, guys. Don't stop. Don't stop asking God. Don't stop seeking him. Don't stop knocking on his door. Don't give up. Don't let your impatience rob you from one more gift. Don't let your impatience keep you from one more blessing that God wants to pour out in your life. Hold firm. Hold tight. Believe in his promises. Believe he'll do what he says he will do. Now, as we, as we wrap up, I want you guys to do something a little weird for me. I want you to put away your notes. I want you to put away your, your Bibles. And I just want you to listen. Now, I know you nerds are going to have an aneurysm because there's two blanks left, Joshua. I know. I made the sheets, all right? We'll get to those. But this is too important. I need you guys to listen. I need you to pay attention. All right? So many of you have been trying so hard you have been trying with all your might, with all your strength to submit to God. You're trying to submit to his will for your life. You're trying to submit to his way of living. You're trying, you're trying, you're trying to submit to his waiting and agree with his timing and not yours. But you've been failing. You've been failing all your life. You've been failing no matter how hard you try. Well, can I make a suggestion? God's not going to let you succeed, all right? God's not going to let you su su succeed at submitting because you've never done the first step. See, the first step of biblical submission is surrender, all right? There is no submission without surrender, all right? You cannot submit to a God that you've never acknowledged his authority. You cannot to submit to somebody you've never agreed to to be your Lord. And so what I'm saying and what, I, what I'm getting at is that you're not going to be able to submit to God if you've never surrendered to his salvation. All right, because that's all salvation is, guys. Salvation is simply surrendering to God's will, his way, and his waiting in your life. God's will for you is that 1 Timothy 2.4 says God wants everyone to be saved and to fully understand the truth. 2 Peter 3.9 says he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. God's will for you is to be saved. Right? But you've got to do it his way. You've got to surrender to his way of accomplishing it. Jesus Christ is that way. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to the Father is through me. Matthew 7, 13 through 14 talks about the narrow gate. 
how there is a, a highway to hell that is broad and easy to follow, but the gateway to life is narrow. The only way to God's salvation is through his son, Jesus Christ, and through complete and total surrender to him. Just stop trying it your way, guys. Stop trying to accomplish God's will in, in your methods according to the way you want to do it. But you've also got to submit to his timing. All right? I'm sure some of you have, have tried and tried and tried to get saved on your own, right? To get saved in, in your will, in your way, and in your timing. Well, that's not how it works, right? God is the one who draws you. God is the one who, who speaks to you and calls you out. And what his, he says in his word, he says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, the right time is now, today is the day of salvation. So please don't put it off. Please don't, don't put off surrendering completely and totally to God's will for your life. Please don't put off surrendering completely and totally to his way of salvation. Right now is that time. Right now is that moment. Can I pray for you? Would you please join me? Father God, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for your truth. And Lord, I thank you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I, I thank you that your ways are higher than my ways and that you, in your wisdom, in your grace, saw fit to send your son, who you love dearly, down to this earth to be a sacrifice for me, to be a sacrifice for everyone in this room. Lord, I pray for those who don't know you as Lord and Savior. God, I, I, I pray for the complete and total utter destruction of their pride and of their rebellion that has kept them from surrendering up in this point. Lord, I pray that you'll bless them with an attitude of humility, Lord, that comes humbly before their God and says, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for trying to do it my way. I'm sorry for trying to do it in my timing. I'm sorry for trying to do it the way I want it. Lord, I, I surrender, God. I, I surrender everything to you. You are Lord, I am not. You are king, I am your servant. You are the master, I am your slave. God, I pray that you would give them hearts of conviction, hearts of repentance, that they might turn to you and be healed. God, open up their eyes, open up their ears, open up their hearts. And Lord, I ask that you'll be with the rest of our invitation now. I thank you for speaking to us. Be with your children. May we respond in obedience and humility. So in Christ's name I pray, amen. Now, as we come to our, our time of invitation, I, I wanted to, obviously, we want to always provide God's children a chance to respond to their father when he speaks, right? Because God has spoken today, whether you realize it or not. It's not because I'm up here, right? It's because his word has been read, okay? And so I want to give you guys some encouragement. I want to give you a, a piece of advice because as we said earlier, just because submission is simple, does not mean it's easy, all right? So submission is hard. Guys, literally just the other day, I had to confess it this morning, I was whining to God like a little toddler throwing a temper tantrum saying, God, I hate submitting. It's so hard, it's so frustrating. And I just wanna give you guys a piece of advice. All right, the, the advice is this, trusting in God's heart leads to submission. Trusting in God's heart for you will lead to your submission. Jeremiah 29, 11 shows us God's heart it says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. You see, if you truly believed that God's will for your life, that his way for your life, and that his waiting for your life is better than yours, submission will come naturally. Okay? If you trust God's heart, everything else will fall into place. And so as we, we do business with God today, I want you to to take that opportunity to pray and ask him for the faith to believe that he is who he says he is and that he will do what he says he will do. The altar is open, guys. As the music plays, as we, we do business with God, examine yourself. Ask God's spirit to search you and confess any rebellion in your heart, right? Any rebellion towards God's will, any rebellion towards his way, any rebellion towards his timing. Repent of your old way of thinking. Repent of your old way of living and receive the freedom, receive the power, receive the blessings that he wants to pour out on you. I'm gonna hush now. You guys talk to God, you guys do business with him, but please, please, please respond to what he's told you to do.